Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom. Today's special guest is Miranda Massey. She is the founder and director of the Climate Museum in New York City. Welcome to the show, Miranda. Delighted to be here, Wendy. Thanks so much for having me on. Anytime. You know, what I love is the fact that I got to visit the museum last week. So I had firsthand knowledge of actually going and seeing it. And it's pretty spectacular what you have created. But before I dive into that, could you please tell people about your background? Because you started as a civil rights attorney in Detroit and then moved into environmental justice. And it's just interesting that you, your progress. Love to share that story. I was a, I was a, a social and racial justice trial lawyer working mostly in Detroit with some cases in California for years and gradually became aware that to me the largest terrain for the question of social inequality in the United States is, is that of the environment. So I was working largely on racial justice in education. The reality is if you don't have an equal right to thrive as a living being in the environment you inhabit, then the right to equal and integrated schooling, to use that example, at best is much harder to enforce and at worst just simply falls away and becomes irrelevant because you're worried about basic physical survival. And once I realized that, I made a pivot to environmental justice work, which is work at the intersection of environmental law and policy on the one hand and social and racial justice on the other. And from there, it was a pretty short hop to the climate crisis, which had been increasingly trying to get my attention and frankly, I kept trying to suppress it and push it aside. So if there are, are listeners out there who are anxious about climate and feel bad because you haven't started to do anything on it yet, know that you're not alone. It took me years between recognizing the climate crisis for what it was and starting to think about directing my energies toward it in a meaningful way. So I think it was two things at base, Wendy, and I'll, and I'll leave it there. The first is that in one sense, the climate crisis is the biggest justice crisis humanity has ever seen. It is yeah. a concatenation of major justice crises, in fact. And then at the same time, it's this overarching existential challenge for our species and our civilization. Those two things aren't in counterpoint. They're joined together at the hip. And that drew me it, 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 unavoidably and um, irresistibly into working on climate. I love the fact that you've interwoven everything with um, society, people, culture, background, access to education, access to equality and equity, because people, when they think climate, they think weather. It's hot. It's cold. Right. It's not. And sustainability isn't just environment. It is also people. It is social justice. It's environmental justice. So weaving these together, you have formed in 2014, I believe, the Climate Museum, which was pretty astronomical thing to do in 2014. Not everybody was really focused on the climate. It's changed a lot. The whole environment in which we do everything has changed dramatically since then. Um, I think the project seemed a little bit insane to more than a, a few of my um, my committee members, my my close friends and advisors and, and family members. Um, but now it's self-evident, both the magnitude of the climate crisis and, and that all of us, in whatever way we can, you don't have to start an organization, obviously, but in whatever way we can, should be trying to do something helpful in relation to it first. But second, that the idea of a, of a space for the general public, um, where, yeah. of course, of course, experienced climate activists are most welcome, but it, our target audience is the general public. And we know, Wendy, that that general public is freaked out about the climate crisis, but mostly shut down and silent because we all feel like we're in a minority um, in supporting aggressive climate policies. So we want to break that climate silence. A museum is a perfect space in which to do that through the arts, through culture. It gives people a soft entry point. It's um, amazing how much better it works even than I thought it would. And I've always been very bullish on the idea. So it's... Um, it has moved from being, as you say, a pretty exotic idea to one that makes a ton of sense to other people. And in fact, two other climate dedicated museums have since been founded in the U.S. Um, and we've been in contact with those guys and had early conversations with one of them and, and served as an inspiration, we understand, for the other. So it's an idea that is no longer out there. 
Um, and that's great to see. And in addition to the final point, museums, museums that are not climate dedicated have started to do much more climate focused programming. And that's critically important too. It's kind of like we need Women's History Month um, and Black History Month. And we also need Women's History and Black History to name two examples to be integrated throughout the curriculum. All of it is necessary for climate. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are all a chain reaction of each other's activities. So let's just start yes. with that. And I love the fact when you said reaching out to the general public, because that's exactly why I started this webcast. So many of us talk in a language of jargon and acronyms that we are excluding people that we are trying to pull into this conversation. And the museum right. is ideal. The museum, museum I mean, is yes. The artwork you have is phenomenal. Why, oh, could you ex explain to people when you walk in, because you go from that shades of gray into mm. color. That's a, that's a very moving thing to walk into. I agree. I agree. I just have to give all praise to our designer, um, Bonnie Siegler at Eight and a Half New York, um, who had the idea of moving from grayscale to color around the perimeter of the show. And I'll describe that in just a little more detail in a sec. Um, and she really pressed for it. There was a moment where having a fully monochrome wall that big because it's not a tiny space oh, no. made me nervous. And I was like, Bonnie, 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 do we really want to do this? And she was like, let me just show you the mock-up. And the minute I thought I knew we had to do it. So the, the space moves from grayscale where you see the ways that climate and social inequality are deeply bound up together. It's not just a coincident, a, a coincidental impact of the climate crisis that vulnerable communities and, and communities of color are hit first and hardest, both in yeah. the U.S. and as a matter of geopolitics. It's actually built into the history of the exploitation of fossil fuels and of the industry. And we have a series of maps in grayscale that communicates that at the global level, the U.S. level, and the New York City level. Um, and then there's a spectacular mural by the unbelievably talented Greg Christie, who just won his most recent award from the New York Times and the New York Public Library for Best Children's Illustrated Book of the Year. Um, he has like more awards than I can name. And he did this incredible mural showing the transition from um, a fossil fuel barren led economy that's in black and white mm -hmm. through the struggle, which is where we are now, um, and the grayscale starts to change. And at the right end of the back wall is this spectacular um, landscape filled with vibrant color, vibrant social interactions, biodiversity. It's just oh, spectacular. Yeah. And it moves from grayscale to color. And then the entire um, right wall is all in bright colors. And it's about taking action and the changes that we can make together, the meaningful actions all of us can take. So I think it's a brilliant concept full credit to our designer. And I think it works beautifully in the space. Oh, it does. I mean, we, when I walked through it and, you know, you, you said it right there, there is no perfect. The answer is always in shades of gray. And we are yeah. navigating through those shades of gray right now and right. trying to find that resolution to the color, to that biodiversity, to just figuring it out, figuring, solving our problems. And you also in the museum, and I couldn't see all of it at once because, you know, it was there for like an hour and a half, but still there's so much to see. There's so much data that you have carefully put into that those exhibits and on those walls that you don't realize you're learning as you're reading. Because yes. it's so fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That is such a such high praise. We we have a lot of people coming out saying, I already thought I knew a lot on these different subjects, whether it's the origins of the fossil fuel industry or the victories that climate and environmental justice okay. leaderships and communities have won against the industry or um, the latest news from New York State, hugely positive legislation from New York State, really world leading legislation in New York State on um, the transition, a just transition to a clean energy economy. Um, people saying how much they learned and how much they enjoyed learning it, which is, of course, the gold standard. So yeah. it's very, very pleasing. And then most of all, as you know, Wendy, our goal, and this differentiates us from a lot of other cultural institutions, the large majority, I would say, um, is we're explicitly activists. We want to give people a sense of their own ability to take meaningful action. Of All of us have agency on this, even though it can feel overwhelming. 
You're not in a minority, even though it feels like you are in every state. Climate justice hawks are a majority, in fact, a super majority. Um, and we have an exhibit about that as well, as you know. But we want to encourage everybody to recognize that power that we all hold um, and to think about their own best way of, of mobilizing themselves um, to help create a ripple effect, what you just said about everybody being a chain reaction for each other in this society, to be yeah. part of a chain reaction of support and demand for climate justice policies. Yeah. And, you know, support and demand. You just nailed it right there because kids are going to learn. And this is oh, this is free to everybody. You host school groups, but children are going to come in and learn. They're going to see things. They're not going to be scared. They're not going to be eco shamed. They're going to learn what's possible, what the what the bright future is, what the colorful future can be. And they're yes. going to bring that message home to their parents. Yes. And they're going to nag their parents and be like, stop doing it this way. <laughs> yes. You know, in when I was a kid, it was different parents set the political agendas for their households. Now it's kids, 100%. It's a shift that's happened generationally. Um, and studies have shown this. In fact, there was one study that um, taught, gave, it was, I think, climate or maybe ecological education for Girl Scouts. And just on a whim, not even really thinking about it, the researchers checked parental, um, did some measurement of parental attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And six months later, the parents' behavior had been changed by this intervention with the Girl Scouts. So kids are fantastic vectors of ideological contamination. In this case, a very positive form of contamination. That's awesome. And you know, yeah, kids really do. They bring home that messaging. I remember when um, when I was a kid and they were like, you know, the buckle up laws came in, you know, wear your yep. safety belt. Not a thing in the early eighties guys. <laughs> and I remember yelling at my mom, put on your seatbelt, put on. I right. was nagging her until she finally did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's that actually that's such a helpful that's such a helpful comparison because there's also studies on this, but it's just intuitive. When we invoke in adults uh, a framework of care for young people, it's a super powerful motivator. So when children are in, in are, are are pushing adults for measures that will increase their likelihood of a safe and good future, whether it's their mom wearing a seatbelt, which increases your likelihood of a safe and good future, or um, taking civic action on the climate crisis, which also does, uh, then that motivates adults in a, in a very powerful way, like almost nothing else does. We all have that kind of care for young people built into our psychologies. I think it's evolutionary. Um, and so it's a really powerful, you know, uh, children are, are uh, uncontaminated by having adapted to business as usual. Yes. They don't see why it's okay for the fossil fuel industry to be giving out tons of campaign donations or whatever. They don't, they haven't been socialized to what is normal around us. And whereas you and I, no matter how much we might resist it, inevitably, we start to see some things as just how it's done and we forget to question them. We just don't have the cognitive bandwidth to question all the absurd things in our world that prop up the climate crisis. Kids, on the other hand, totally free of that. Plus, they have the moral authority of having a longer future than adults do. And so for them, the impacts are gonna be much more excruciating. And so that combination of moral clarity on the one hand and moral authority on the other makes kids, with respect to climate in particular, an unbelievable set of advocates. Oh, yes. And I mean, as you mentioned, you know, they, they, we've become a little numb to things and almost yes. accepting of, you know, the pollution in the air. It's a little bit better today. How right. about this? Let's not have it at all. <laughs> like not have any. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, you exactly. Know, I, exactly. Yeah. California in the 70s, they would have, you know, elderly and children go inside. The smog is too thick. That should not happen. <laughs> so it's, now we're right. saying, well, yeah. And the people now are saying, well, it's not as bad as it was in the 70s. Great. But let's continue that progress forward 50 years later, which should be a little bit more advanced than what we are now. Now, going back to a museum with respect to climate, yes. not everyone. You know, you said there are only a couple other people doing this. And it's through your inspiration that they started. Why do people find that to be a challenge of artwork and climate being so closely married together? I think it's a couple of things. I think first it's hard to start 
a new venture, period. Anybody who's yeah. started any kind of small business, you know this from having started this podcast. There's a million problems that you had getting it going that I can't even imagine. Time from small to huge. And um, there's that just as a baseline thing. Second, on climate, if you're going to be doing exhibitions that look good, which is important for the exhibitions yeah. to be effective, that's an expensive business. And climate philanthropy, get this, is only 2% of overall philanthropy globally. It's absolutely bonkers. Speaking of the insanity of our business as usual, totally bonkers, right? I mean, how do you explain yeah. that to a in sociologist? It makes no sense. And then within that, within that, there's a particular blind spot, and I'm coming to your, to your question more closely now, on climate arts and climate cultural work. And I think that's because on the climate side, there's been just a massive bias toward funding climate policy analysis and advocacy. And hmm. that 100% should be fully funded, no doubt, much more robustly than it is. Yeah. No argument, no quarrel with that. But that has taken up the massive lion's share of funding that's directed toward any kind of climate venture. And I think on the art side, because climate has been, these things relate to each other, because climate has been seen as, as kind of wonky and policy-based, there's this sense that you're crassly instrumentalizing the arts if you mobilize them to help empower people to see their own agency on climate, which doesn't make sense when you look at how happy arts patrons are to mobilize the arts for social justice, for example, as they should be. Totally support yeah. that. But climate has been perceived, and this goes back to a point you were making just a few minutes ago, as not about people, um, as not about justice. Once we recognize that the climate crisis is a justice crisis and that the arts are profoundly helpful in drawing people into a sense of connection with each other, into a sense of recognizing the amazing things our species can do, um, and when it's not framed as being about policy and you don't have to understand the advanced physics of the climate crisis. It's about yeah. what you feel and what you know in your in your heart. Um, once you do that and the arts do that, it, yeah, it, it's magical how people respond. I, you know, I was just leading up to the, you did it for me. It's climate and the environment is 100% science-based. Art invokes emotion. And yes. that is what people are going to, it's going to, people are going to use those two things to help them understand Yes. And as you said, you know, you think with your heart and yes. we are actively poisoning our air, our water, our land. Let's stop doing that. And if it means that they have to learn through the art and the science melded together, I think that's a fantastic mix. It is. I, I it, The way people respond to the show um, has been incredibly confirming and inspiring and 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 definitely backs up backs up your perception. We get. um we just get incredible feedback from people who come in and who are so happy to have had the chance to take in this this content, the intellectual content, the emotional content, the invitation to take action, to see yourself as as having the capacity to take meaningful action. All of it really lands with people and is very meaningful. And that's the call to action that needs to happen. And I'm a little um, upset that it's only 2% of all philanthropy goes to climate. So you are a 501c3. You are a nonprofit. You need donations. How do people find you? Where can they give you money? <laughs> Thank you very much for that question, Wendy. Um, we are we are climatemuseum.org and we have a donate page and we um, are so grateful for anything that people um, uh, can, can, can do to help us out, to help us continue to present this kind of work. Uh, joining our effort um, financially is incredibly helpful. We also, for people in the New York City um, area, we have a really robust volunteer program. We're just, we, we want to bring as many people on the team in as many different ways as possible. And financial support is definitely a huge part of what we need and a huge yeah. part of that. But for people who aren't able to make a donation, know that it's not the only way you can be part of our, part of our effort. Excellent. And, and you're so perfectly located You're on Worcester Street in Soho in New York City. Fabulous location. Amazing street. I mean, I used to love wandering Soho when I lived there. Um, that was a pretty lucky spot that you got, actually. <laughs> it is. Uh, we are 
just profoundly lucky in the place where we are. I'll say first, you know, Soho is not a very lower lowercase d democratic place to live. It's quite expensive, obviously, residentially. But in terms of access for all New Yorkers and for tourists, both domestic and international, there's almost no subway that doesn't have a stop that's convenient to our location. So that's yeah. the key for social accessibility. And there are so many stores now in Soho, including big box stores that are very popular and democratic, that it's a great, it's a perfect location for us. It's also a beautiful space. And we got incredibly lucky when um, a top executive for who manages high-end flagship retail in North America for Cushman and Wakefield, his name is Andy Kahn, um, read an article about us, a really lovely profile that ran in the Washington Post and took the initiative to call us and ask how he could help. And that is the only way that we have been able to find any of our Manhattan locations. Because if you think it's hard to find an apartment in New York, you have never tried uh, finding a short-term commercial real uh, 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 rental space. It's we would never have been able to navigate it, frankly. It's just a whole universe of expertise. So um, there are a lot of times when we have uh, re relied on the kindness of strangers, and that is definitely one of them, just a, a, a an angel of good luck sitting on our shoulder. Sounds like a good man. That is a really, that's what, see, that's what I love hearing those stories that people reach out and say, how can I help? First question, it how was, can I help? Yes. How can I help? That, that, that was his question, and he's helped us immeasurably. I mean, you saw that space. It's it's a spectacular space. It's a great it location is. for us. And 100%, I mean, let's say, let me let me reverse that, 0% chance that we would have found it without him. Absolutely. No, and it's it's a great organization. Um, So when people want to, you know, donate this climatemuseum.org, they can find you. You're on LinkedIn. That's pretty easy to find yes. you on LinkedIn as well. If people want to, um, hopefully large corporations will reach out and say, how can we help? Those that would be fantastic. We, our, our phone lines are, are open and ready for your call. <laughs> um, but I, I, we are we are very much looking. This is a moment of profound opportunity for us. This is our second Manhattan um, short term show. Uh, it'll, when I say short term, it will run about eight months in total. Um, and what we would like to do is have a lease of, let's say, five years plus, because uh, for a lot of reasons, but the, the main thing is that allows us to provide a kind of hub and home for the climate interested public in a way that is just not as true when you're continually having to move. There are also astounding operational costs associated with having to move all the time. It's ridiculously inefficient and dumb. Um, but <laughs> but we're, we're very much at a moment of opportunity for that kind of growth. Um, and so um, for the, for, for the, for a, a lead donor who wants to get on board with creating a new institution at a new level that has yeah. really transformative capacity, this is the moment. It absolutely is. And the timing is absolutely perfect because people are now paying attention. It's, it's everyone's forefront in their mind, which is we're a little late to the game, but thank God it's happening now. So yes. Miranda, you are leading that you are leading that charge of getting people to understand. And that's the important part is getting everyone involved, everyone to understand, um, simplifying it, keeping it simple and letting them know, avoid the perfect, sit in the gray, figure out the answers. We're going to get there. And that's the hope yes. that we need. We can get there together. We can only get there together and we will get there if we come together and st start working through it with. Um, I'll, I'll steal from one of my favorite TV shows with clear eyes and full hearts. We absolutely yeah. can do this. I love that. That is fantastic. So on that, Miranda, thank you so much for your time today. Please guys check out the climate museum. It is in Manhattan in Soho on Worcester street. That's W O O S T E R <laughs> for people who don't know. And um, thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy. So I, I am grateful for your time today. Very grateful to have been here. And I know you said this at the top of the show, Wendy, but just to underscore, everything is free. Entry is free. Our events are free. Our youth workshops are free. Um, we want everyone to be able to participate without without cost being a barrier. So we hope that we hope to see you soon. Perfect form of equity right there. <laughs>
You guys take care. I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. Please check out the Climate Museum in Manhattan and please check out Miranda Massey on LinkedIn. She can help you out and please help them stay afloat and donate as much as you can. Talk to you later. Bye.